welcome back to Carry On Sailing again. And so for this episode, uh, I'm trying to add some value again in that uh, we're going very technical. Um, and although it's not for everybody, um, I'm hoping that for aspiring sailors or for those that are already sailing, it might help you uh, come to uh, some decisions about technology and um, help you understand that the majority of, of sailing and, and blue water sailing is actually about maintenance and uh, sailing and using the wind is quite a small portion of, of what it's all about. Welcome to the tech room of Carry On. So uh, I thought it was a good idea for Eva to walk down the stairs and show you how much space, standing space we have here. Um, so it's quite impressive, I think you'll agree. And um, the reality is that if you're going to be taking a boat across an ocean, you're going to have to do some maintenance. You've got to expect it because essentially what you're doing is you're putting all the stuff that you might have in a house and you're shaking it. And depending on, on, on the seas that you come across, uh, it could potentially be quite a lot of shaking. And so I can tell you, we, we've, we've had to suffer some pretty, pretty intense seas, uh, particularly in Morocco. And, and that's, uh, that, that puts a lot of strain on the bits and pieces that you carry with you. So the less things you have, the less work you have to do, but the more things you have, uh, then the more work you have to do, but then you could argue that it's more luxurious. So what I thought, um, what we'll do is, I wanna show you some of the modifications that I've made. Um, now I have to say, some things you can't modify, which is for example, the place of the, the seacocks, and I think the shipyard have done a great, uh, a great uh, strategy. Um, and it's one of the things Eric showed me whenever he, um, I bought the boat, which is that most of the seacocks, apart from one, most of the seacocks are around me by my feet. So um, you can see there's the layout of all things below the waterline is here. And actually the waterline um, is, is about this level over here. So um, but that makes you think, um, you know, this space, you know, if, if it becomes, if the boat, the boat will float, uh, you know, if she becomes flooded, this, it, it, it would float, but this space essentially could become um, waterlogged, right? So what I've done is I've added um, two uh, extra um, uh, pumps, essentially, to try and get the water out. One is for an emergency and it's manually activated. I've added it here, and this is my 24 volt distribution, okay? So it's illogical that I would put a pump, which is 24 volts, on this panel. And then another one I've added, which I use a lot for maintenance. And I think it's one of the greatest hacks on a boat that I've added. I just simply um, got a normal, um, uh, it's actually a whale, uh, let's see, a Gulper 220. Um, it's quite a cool name actually, isn't it? Um, so the Gulper 220, and then at the other end I've added this. So you can see, just with a remote, and that can start sucking out water. And why is that relevant? Well, <clears throat> it's, it, it reduces a lot of stress, especially when you're on your own, um, and particularly at sea, because this, this piece of equipment, which is the aircon, um, requires quite a lot of maintenance because um, you're taking sea water to cool the compressors. We take the water in, and what we do is, because we've got sea life, um, we've got sea life here, we, we're gonna strain it, we're gonna strain that water here, um, and then we're gonna send it with a, with a pump, put high pressure and send it through the loop, and then send it back out through the boat. What I need to do is clear the nature, um, so like seashells and a little bit of seaweed that's got past the filter in here. I'll need to flush that out, so I'll reverse the system. So, because this is above the water line, the water will come back, back a ways through the system and fall out the strainer here, and I'll give it a tap, clean it out, um, and I'll obviously have this seacock closed and flush it open and close it. So that means that quite a lot of water. You can see a little bit sitting here. Um, I've left for demonstration, obviously. And so now I'll switch on my pump. I just get these little last bits out, little last bits of water out. Um, but yes, yeah, it just means that it's a little bit um, more sanitary as well because if you have any standing water in the tropics for any length of time on a boat, um, you can get mosquitoes forming and, and insects and stuff. As you can see, there's a couple of guys, just as I'm filming, there's a couple of little guys here having a go. And I think they're probably gonna try and get Elba's dog food. Here you 
can see the two compressors here and I won't touch them because they've been running. I've switched it off, but the compressors take a lot of energy. So that's one of the big decisions that you're, you're, you're gonna, um, gonna make um, when you buy a boat is, do you really want marine aircon? And um, I can tell you there's been a lot of moments when we're really glad we have it. And there's been a lot of moments when I'm very irritated with it. This is a Webasto system. Um, and uh, I, I, I find it frustrating. Um, and, and I think everybody does um, with that aspect of it. Ebus helped me the other day and in the fact that um, there's another system, which obviously we're chilling, in this system we're chilling water. So we chill water and we send water throughout, throughout the boat. And then each individual cabin, you then have an air handling unit which takes that cold water and you simply blow air across the cold water. That's the simple method of it. And, and by blowing the air, it then cools the room. Two problems with that. Um, you're sending fresh water throughout the boat, so you'll have a fresh water system. So if you have a leak, you have water coming out. You can get air in the system. But the other thing that always happens, even in a, in a, in a uh, correctly functioning uh, air con system, is that you get condensation. And so you need to, to remove condensation. And then, so what we do is we take the condensation from the air handling units in each cabin and we send it to this box. And this box basically has a bilge pump. Um, and then it takes the water uh, from each air handling unit. And when, once the float switch is reached, it just throws the water overboard. The big question you should be asking is, why do we bother with all this effort, you know, using the seawater to cool um, and all the maintenance is associated with it. Well, the reality is that it's a much more efficient system. And um, that means that we can have a much more powerful uh, system cooling the boat for a smaller generator using less fuel. In fact, they're so efficient now, the newer ones within three years that I bought this boat, um, that you can now run some small air conditioning systems off the batteries. And that means uh, during the day it's possible uh, you can run a small aircon unit to cool the boat off solar and of course then the dream is at night time you have no noise at all and a nice cool uh, sleep in the tropics at anchor. Okay, so now um, some of the modifications I've made down here. Um, the first one, um, which I think is really important and it transformed uh, my quality of life on board. Um, especially when I have friends or guests, um, uh, on the family members and guests on board. It's a big boat and it'd be a bit strange to get such a big boat without having friends on board, right? So um, the, the toilets are freshwater toilets on this, on this vessel. And that means that you have less problems with smells. Freshwater toilets, although they use fresh water, um, so when you're offshore, uh, it, it, you have to be a little bit um, uh, more wise with your usage. But if you have a water maker, it should be okay, as long as your water maker is working. So I changed the fresh water pump, um, upgraded it very significantly. Um, and if Eva comes around and pans around, you can see on the other side from where Eva is, you can see the pressure gauge. And this pump is from Fate. Yeah, it's from Fate. So you can see the pressure gauge on the front here. And then I've added these just as an emergency. So if, if the um, priming valves, which you can see one here, happen to blow off, it doesn't spray um, uh, water all over my batteries, which if Eva stands back up the stairs, I can show you that the batteries are over here. We can create 220 liters of fresh water an hour. Um, and to do that, we use only uh, one gallon of diesel. That's quite incredible. So this is the desolator and, and of all the things on this boat, I've a touch wood, I haven't really had any problems at all. It's a self contained system, it doesn't need much servicing. And um, I have to say it's one of the things that I can recommend. Um, the, the only thing I would say about it is that because I chose the aircon system, it made sense to have a generator. All right. And it's 11 kVA generator. And because I got the aircon system, I got the generator. And because of the, the generator, that meant that I could then get an AC, a 220 volt, an alternating current water maker. But in an ideal world, you would maybe think about also having a DC water maker. And why is the question? Well, it means that if you run out of fuel, you have a good chance of 
making water, although not as much, you can make fresh water off the batteries. And I have a lot of solar up above, and so that means you can make fresh water off the batteries. And you may remember from one of the previous um, videos, we were having problems in Jamaica, and we sailed all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And one of the things I had to consider for all my fuel was how much water I can make with that much fuel. So this is the view looking forward uh, towards the bow. And I'm in the middle hull, obviously, in the tech room. So we've got the washer dryer over on this side, pretty obvious. This is an Onan Cummins 11 kVA generator. And on the port side, we've got 616, 616 liters of water and 616 of diesel. And in the back there, you can see some of the instrumentation for the B&G uh, and networking. That's, it's, it's essentially a, a network system, very like that um, in a normal computer um, uh, networking system. So if I move forward, you can see over here, there's a well-labeled manifold system for all your hot and cold water. And so if you have a problem, which we have had, um, I mentioned it in previous videos, early videos, that this, this feed, high pressure feed hose um, burst um, and we had a lot of water released in, into, the, um, into this cabin, or let's say into the tech room. Um, but it's no major disaster, you know, we came down very quickly um, and uh, closed off the manifold and switched off the power for the, uh, for the fresh water pump. And, and then just simply I replaced this hose with whatever I have. So smart to carry a little bit of spare hose, right? Here you have uh, a distribution box, a distribution panel for um, the shore power and power in general on board. So even with, if we're connected to shore power, which you can see at the moment that we are, um, it will take precedence over the inverter, which is that big blue box. And that's the shore power charger. And if I were to run the generator, it would take precedence over the shore power. And that makes sense because if you have unreliable shore power, then you wouldn't be able to uh, charge your batteries and you'd have all sorts of problems and uh, you wouldn't be able to run the aircon. So it makes sense to have the hierarchy generator first, second uh, shore power, and then third inverter. People with a sharp eye will be asking, what is this? So I've installed um, a hydro generator um, and I won't touch on it too much because simply I don't recommend it, but um, it's a hydro generator and a wind generator at the same time. And the power output of both is not really worth the effort. You would be better off to spend your money on solar or batteries. So that's part of that system. And I'll discuss that later if anybody's interested. So welcome to the engine room on carry on. So obviously it's just aft of the tech room and we have a Volvo Penta D275, just one. And I'm sure a lot of people will have a lot of opinions about whether one engine is good or two engines is better. Um, but I can tell you that this engine is a good engine, but what I'm not that happy about is the gearbox, which is the sail drive. And why it bothers me is that if you have a, a damaged seal, a propeller shaft seal, which let's just remember is about five pounds or five euros, maybe eight dollars to fix. Um, and, and what happens is the, the shaft seal gets pushed forward and water can enter into the, into the transmission. And so what could happen is that I, I could put on my diving kit, change the seal and extract all the water and the oil and then just put oil back in. But no, I can't do that because you cannot fully extract all the oil and water mix if you have that problem with this gearbox. So what does that mean? You've got to haul out the boat to change the oil completely. So there are some little hints and tips about that. Some people say if you add molybdenum, um, a lot of molly mix to your uh, transmission, it can really help with the lubrication. Something I haven't tried yet. Um, and there's a lot of time on, on, on uh, a lot of forums has been spent to try and find a solution for this. I'm just going to touch on the fact that we have a 100 amp alternator on this engine from Masterbolt and it's very good. I um, haven't really had any problems with it. I know some people might have had, but a lot of people have a lot of problems with a lot of things, but certainly I haven't. Um, and it's very good at charging the batteries. So if you didn't go for the aircon and you didn't really need a generator, you could probably get away with just using the alternator. There's a lot of reasons why people don't show you their engine rooms, um, but um, yeah, 
it, they're never they're never a pretty place to be. Uh, and so, I think Neil does a pretty good job in the fact that you've got m at least a lot of space to work in here. Um, so your your gearbox and um, and engine servicing happen here. Um, so it's pretty easy to get access. You've got two points to get access to your um, to your oil to suck it out here, which we've done many times. And similarly, um, I'm going to take the, the camera off either. And similarly, we've got the the um, the gearbox here. So you've got your gearbox uh, dipstick here. Um, I can go through those later whenever I actually need to do a service, but uh, we'll leave those for another time. You may have seen from Paul and Cheryl on Distant Shores that um, I showed them how this works. This is the uh, Dyneema steering quadrant. So you have the autopilot RAM here for the autopilot and there's the autopilot computer. Um, and that tells the servos and all the wizardry. Um, somebody far more intelligent than I am has designed that all. There's the servo. Um, has basically designed this quadrant to work off Dyneema. And here's your pulley blocks, very simple. It's a short distance from the pulley blocks and it goes straight up to the helm and the helm is just there. It's only about two meters away. And, and what that means is that with the tension in these, you, you get a good feedback on the helm. And that's, a, that's pretty critical for a trimaran because you're trying to oversheat the main sheet, which would normally on a monohull, you'd have oversheating and too much weather helm, but we're trying to get that nice balance to get the hulls out of the water and get the best performance that we possibly can. So thank you for making it this far in the video. I know it's a bit intense, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it and you see the value of it. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, can you send me your uh, bank account details and sort code uh, via Instagram? Nah, I'm only joking. Just uh, click like, which is over here, and subscribe or somewhere over there. And I'll see you next time.